Good evening. Here we are at our 14th and last class of the finished kingdom. I hope you've been able to at least catch a glimpse, a good, plump, juicy glimpse, I hope, of the truth that nothing is new under the sun, that God does not give nor withhold, but that the experience of one minute's time in our sense, or an hour, or a day, a week, a year, has been sitting there eternally as its truth, as pure God. And it is us who have awakened to it in and as our sense of it, our experience. The flower we will see tomorrow morning or after class has been right here forever. Its very experience has been right here forever. It is us who arrives at it, not it that arrives as or in or for us. The whole of God is us and is for us in experience so that we can be the God of experience. That's why there's no other reason. In other words, there's no selfish reason, no personal reason. But the whole of God is us, for us, so that we can be the whole of God for our sense of experience. That's where it starts, continues and ends. That's the reason, the purpose of being. And anything of our experience is our discovering it, or awakening to it, or arriving at it in experience, not it coming to us, or it performing for us, or it healing us, it prospering us, it bringing love. We are love, we are health, we are wealth, we are truth, and the whole of it. And as we awaken to truth, to the truth we are and have, to the finished kingdom of truth that we are and we have, then it is that all the good of the kingdom, all the good of eternity and infinity and omnipresence is ever more quickly or, or we may say sometimes instantly in our experience. We are that awareness which moves. God does not move. So I hope you've caught a glimpse of this, a good one, so that you never again make effort for that which seems to be needed or that which seems to be not needed, that which you want to be rid of. I hope you've caught a glimpse of the truth that all you ever need to do is in our articulation that seems to have come forth in this class, be well versed and rehearsed in the truth of truth so that at any moment and many, many moments throughout the day and night you simply close off your senses Either literally or figuratively, it doesn't matter. Just close off your senses and feel God right there. The whole of the kingdom right there. And know that as you feel it, the whole of the kingdom is alight with that truth. Is revealed as the formation of that truth. The health, the wealth, the infinity, the omnipresence, the purpose the joy, the freedom, the harmony, is the very second you feel God happening everywhere throughout your kingdom at the same time. Fully formed, perfect, demonstrated. I hope you've caught a glimpse of that and a good juicy one, that God is demonstrated. 
God is manifested. There's no unmanifested God, undemonstrated God, God that needs to become demonstrated or manifested or visible or tangible in your experience. All this is unfortunately metaphysical nonsense. It's not spiritual truth at all, none of it. God is, period. And that, once we've awakened sufficiently, is itself sufficient for us to simply be still and be filled with gratitude for the is that we are. Meaning the is that our whole experience is, our whole kingdom is. I hope you've caught a good, ripe, plump glimpse of the fact that you are cause. You are it, and no cause is unembodied. Cause meaning principle, presence, God itself. The reason form is in experience. Therefore, because of this, and realizing that cause... Principal presence is omnipresent. Wherever you place your presence, even if you may describe it as simply observing something, you're not doing that at all. You're being the presence over there that the material sense thinks it is seeing over there and what it is seeing over there. That's not the truth. If you place your awareness over there, then you are being over there. You are being that which is observed over there. Whatever that is. So whatever that is, animate, inanimate, a being, a thing, again, all of these names just of belief, whatever it is, you're witnessing the cause that in experience makes this body or this thing to be present. You're witnessing a being or a thing or an amount or an activity. Well, right there is the cause being that thing. Cause is always embodied. It's impossible to separate cause from body or body from cause in the same way that it's impossible to separate wet from water. One and the other are the very same one. So if you're seeing anything at all, you are seeing cause. If you see or experience any wet at all, you are experiencing water or liquid, let's say water. And the seeming two are inseparable. They're actually the same thing. And in this very way, cause and body are the same thing. And because cause is infinite, the reason why experience exists, is infinity itself, the very presence, the principle itself. And because of that, everything you're witnessing is of the quality and the condition of the infinite, of God. Therefore, indeed, infinite, omnipresent, eternal, unchanging, invariable. Our experience of that body of cause, body of God, place of God, experience of God, will change, always will change. As we rise in awareness, then what we're witnessing rises in awareness or rises in experience, let's say, at the same time. As I be lifted up, I draw all men unto me. As I be lifted up, I draw the whole world unto me. And so the level at which I am aware is the level at which I experience. So all the world and everyone and everything in it becomes ever more pure, ever more obvious and visible and real as its spiritual reality, instead of appearing material. Everything, everywhere is ever more known and witnessed as infinite. It can change its form. Don't be surprised and don't be scared when you witness this. Bask in the glory of it. Bask with gratitude in front of it. Because it's love presenting its purpose to you and comfort and help and way to you. 
That may or may not happen in this span of experience for you. It doesn't really matter. What matters is what do you know it is? What are you able then to rest in and let be? What are you able to release? How much are you able to just close your eyes a hundred times a day, a thousand times a day and bask in the presence, the felt presence of God happening and be a hundred percent satisfied with that? Because you know it's all. There is nothing else. How much can you be satisfied with that experience, knowing that it's all, so that you stop the nonsense of looking for it in something called matter? There isn't anything called matter, so stop looking for truth in matter. Look for truth in and as truth, and then you'll see what everyone else calls matter as miraculous. Let's read a little for our last class from the Gospel of Truth, which is the most beautiful document. It's the celebration of awakening, and it's believed to have been written about 150 years B.C., certainly before 180 BC, and so not so long after Jesus left the physical experience. And it's really marvellous, so let's read little bits from this, and you will recognise so well what is shared. The gospel of truth is joy for those who have received from the Father of truth the grace of knowing him through the power of the word that came forth from the pleroma. Pleroma is plentitude. Webster says the fullness of divine excellencies and power. The one who is in the thought and the mind of the Father, that is, the one who is addressed as the Saviour, that being the name of the work he is to perform for the redemption of those who were ignorant of the Father, while in the name of the Gospel is the proclamation of hope, being discovery for those who search for him. When the totality went about searching for the one from whom they had come forth. Now, the totality is experience. When the totality went about searching for the one from whom they had come forth, and the totality was inside of him, the incomprehensible, inconceivable one who is superior to every thought... Ignorance of the Father brought about anguish and terror. Sound familiar? And the anguish grew solid like a fog. Sound familiar? So that no one was able to see. For this reason, error became powerful. For this reason, error became powerful. The pairs of opposites believe themselves and believe themselves ever more. It worked on its own matter foolishly, not having known the truth. It set about with a creation, preparing with power and beauty the substitute for the truth. There's the pairs of opposites. There's definitely both bad and good, ugliness and terror and much beauty in and of the pairs of opposites, but none of it is truth. 
in and of its own self. And I hope, and I hope you've caught a good, ripe glimpse of that. It's not that form is error or evil or untrue. It's the very opposite. Form is beautifully true, perfectly true. But the belief in it being something of its own self, its own life, its own body, its own purpose, its own amount, its own activity. There's the mistake and there is what keeps the truthful experience of all form away from those who do believe in it. This was not then a humiliation for him, the incomprehensible, inconceivable one, For they were nothing. The anguish and the oblivion and the creature of deceit. While the established truth is immutable, imperturbable, perfect in beauty. For this reason, despise error. For this reason, despise or resist belief. Don't believe anything you can name. Don't believe anything you experience as being anything of reality in and of its own self. And therefore, don't react. Don't try to do something about it. Fix it. Heal it. Don't do it. Otherwise, you're just trying to manipulate the pairs of opposites. Where is God in that picture? Thus, it had no root. Isn't that interesting? So, you see, let us understand that. If the pairs of opposites are actually nothing of their own selves, then actually they cannot have a root. Now, we've used the term, and it's been used before us. We've heard the instruction, and it's been heard before us. To go to the root of the problem. But, and this is true in experience. This is very true in experience. If we go to the root of belief, if we understand all the pairs of opposites and all the anguish of them, and all the struggle and effort of them, the temporality of them, the variable experience we have if we believe the pairs of opposites, if we understand the whole lot to be belief, then we have the root of the problem in experience. And we're interested in experience, just as Buddha was and just as Jesus was, who understood this very secret of experience. But actually, if the pairs of opposites are nothing, then they have no root. And you'll discover this. There comes a time. If they were real, therefore if there was a real root, then we'd have to forever be working at that root. That isn't true. There comes a time when we don't have to work anymore because we know it so deeply and naturally that the pairs of opposites simply cannot tempt us or cannot convince us is maybe a better term to use at the moment. We've lifted above the temptation of the pairs of opposites. And we're free. That does not mean that sometimes the pairs of opposites sneak in and try their best. And at those times, if it happens, then we simply and easily remember, oh, belief, collective belief, that's what's presenting itself to me. So we go straight to belief and shoo it away again, get the hence Satan, and we're back free of it. But you catch the point. If it were real, therefore if it had a real root, then that reality would have to be worked on forever. Of course, there is no reality in the pairs of opposites, nor its root, because only God is reality. Let's carry on. Thus it had no root. It fell into a fog regarding the Father, while it was involved in preparing works and oblivions, and terrors. 
the very act of being involved or continuing to be involved in the pairs of opposites strengthens it. What have we always said? If you work at your problem, or if you try to get God to solve your problem, all you're actually doing is holding the problem in your awareness and cementing it more right where it seems to be and quickly it seems to be worse than it was before we started. It is the releasing of experience in God that releases all problem to reveal God. It fell into a fog regarding the Father while it was involved in preparing works and oblivions and terrors in order that by means of these it might entice those of the middle and capture them. It might entice those who are in the middle of the pairs of opposites and capture them. In other words, those who aren't affected by bad, those who aren't affected by good. They're just perfectly happy, thank you. But one of these days, illness is going to come about. Disease is going to come about. A beautiful love is going to come about. A wondrous wealth is going to come about. Wonderful success is going to come about. And what happens? It collapses one day, somehow, in one or other of the aspects of life. Why? Because it never had any legs. It's a house built on sand. It's a shadow. It's Jesse's shadow. The oblivion of error was not revealed. It is not an error from the Father. Oblivion did not come into existence from the Father although it did indeed come into existence because of him. Again, we heard yesterday, even the shadow cannot be in experience if it is not for light. And so only the presence of light reveals the shadow. And now lift into truth and realize, as we had very, very thoroughly yesterday and just now, that no matter what you're experiencing, good or bad, The reason for its very existence in your experience is because actually the Father is right there. Truth is right there. Without truth being right there, nothing would be in or of experience. Truth is the only substance, the only form, the only experience. So just as the shadow can't be in experience without light, nothing, nothing, nothing can be in experience without God. What you're observing as good or bad, is the whole of God actually. And so as we withdraw from what we believe it to be good or bad into God alone and then let God reveal what's actually presenting itself to us, there we quickly witness what actually is the truth of experience at each place, at each hour, at each day, as each condition, as each expression. But what comes into existence in him is knowledge, is awareness. We become aware of truth. Remember Solomon, seek wisdom and knowledge. That's all you need because there isn't any unembodied wisdom or knowledge. God is consciousness and so all is awareness. And so the more of God we have, which means the more aware we become of all being God, then the more we have as God experience. In other words, the more God form, the more God love, harmony, wealth, success, joy, freedom, purpose we have as experience. One and the other are the same. Again, as I be lifted up, I draw all unto me. In fact, I believe we'll hear about that in the Gospel of Truth in a short while. What comes into existence in him is knowledge, which appears in order that oblivion might vanish and the Father might be known. Since oblivion came into existence because the Father was not known, then if the Father comes to be known, 
Oblivion will not exist from that moment on. I think this gospel should be right after Genesis 1, don't you? Through this, the gospel of the one who is searched for, which was revealed to those who are perfect through the mercies of the Father, the hidden mystery, Jesus, the Christ, enlightened those who were in darkness through oblivion. He enlightened them. And we should bring this into current tense always. He enlightens them. He shows them the way. And the way is the truth which he teaches them. Again, there it is. The way of truthful experience is the truth which we become aware of. All being embodied. We cannot become aware of anything without its body. So the more pure, the more spiritual our awareness, then the more pure and spiritual our experience, the body of experience. This is why the moment we realize that our body is spirit and not matter, as soon as we really know and rest and be satisfied in the experience of the body of spirit happening, very, very quickly we find our body whole and healthy or healed, very quickly. Because our heightened spiritual awareness is our body. As for the incomprehensible, inconceivable one, the Father, the perfect one, the one who made the totality, within him is the totality, and of him the totality has need. Experience needs the Father, which is the conscious awareness of all being the totality, the Father, in order for experience, the totality, to be the Father, to be witnessed, to be experienced as truth. He retains within himself their perfection, granting it to them as a return to him and a perfectly unitary knowledge. It is he who fashioned the totality, and within him is the totality, and the totality was in need of him. Don't struggle with that word need. If we... Look out at experience. It is in desperate need of God. Is it not? In desperate need of truth. And this is what is being spoken of. We are told that the Father is the totality. So here we have God, mind, form. God is, mind is, form. And mind and form is God, is in God. And yet, as we look out at the totality... Before we are in God awareness, it needs God. Just as there lies hidden in a will, before it is opened, the fortune of the deceased master of the house, so it is with the totality, which lay hidden while the father of the totality was invisible, being something which is from him from whom every space comes forth. Can the finished kingdom be clearer than that? Oh, such great teaching! He draws himself down to death, though life eternal clothes him. We're speaking of the Master right now having stripped himself of the perishable rags, he put on imperishability, which no one can possibly take away from him. Once we have truth, 
then no one and nothing, nothing or no one in the universe can take that truth from us. And because truth is always embodied, nothing and no one in the universe can take our fully embodied truth away from us. The world may be suffering, the economy may be suffering, the whole world may have contracted some disease, the whole world might be at war with itself, but we, in truth, have our truth, have our safety, have our supply. And again, there are plenty of accounts throughout Scripture and more modern writings of this very truth witnessed as an individual who stays in truth whilst there is medical or warring or supply chaos happening around him or her, and yet he or she is perfectly protected and safe and supplied. The miracle of truth is right there in the midst of chaos. Read the 91st Psalm. It's all there. Since the perfection of the totality is in the Father, here we have our withdrawing from that which seems to be into oneness and realizing that everything is witnessed out of oneness. All mind, all form is witnessed truthfully out of oneness. So oneness is where we want to be. Oneness is the truth of being and mind and world. So as we withdraw from the belief of that which seems to be into oneness and we rehearse, we know some truth again, we contemplate and we feel the peace beginning to well up and fill our universe. There we have the whole of truth witnessed, visible, tangible, demonstrated here and now. And you can think of any aspect of your life and realize that and come into oneness and realize that the truth of it is actually oneness. And as you feel oneness happening, you have the infinity, you have the omnipresence, you have the life, you have the love, you have the home, you have the safety. And if you're satisfied with that experience of oneness and don't look for it in what is called matter, then it'll quickly or sooner or later be very, very real to you in the formed experience of life. Since the perfection of the totality is in the Father, it is necessary for the totality to ascend to Him. What do we have ever since last summer as a metaphor? Rise in consciousness. If you want to go from the basement or the first floor up to the 10th or the 30th or the roof garden and experience life up there, the only way of it is to get in the elevator and rise to where it is instead of expecting it to come down to where you are. It's been here since 150 AD. Then, if one has knowledge he receives what are his own and draws them to himself. For he who is ignorant is in need, and what he lacks is great, since he lacks that which will make him perfect. Spiritual awareness. The perfection of the totality is in the Father, and it is necessary for the totality to ascend to Him, and for each one to receive what are His own. One who has knowledge is the one whose name the Father has uttered. For he whose name has not been spoken is ignorant. Indeed, how is one to hear if his name has not been called? Now this calling 
is your impulse in truth. You heard the calling, and in this beautiful scripture we hear that God is calling your name. You are now one of the called ones. And what it means is that from this moment, you have felt the impulse to search for God, search for truth. Whatever that looks like, it doesn't matter. You have felt the impulse. And it's so important to realize that it's not anything of your own doing. It's not your decision. You are being propelled now to truth. And if you can get yourself onto the straight and narrow quickly, as we all are, unlike me who was on a very long and winding road when I first was called, But you see, now we have the truth that enables us to get onto the straight and narrow right away. If we can hear just sufficient truth to do this, then our calling and the fulfillment of it is really very quick indeed. We're witnessing just in these five years of the miracle self, or five and a half years or so of the miracle self, the most extraordinary awakening amongst the groups. Most extra- I've never seen anything so quick or never heard of it. So once we're really in possession of a clear and straight and simple, logical, authoritative truth, then we can keep ourselves on the straight and narrow. And if we adhere to that straight and narrow, we'll find ourselves standing right in the middle of heaven very, very quickly. But... It's like any principle. We have to know that it is it alone. There's no wiggle room. There's no alternative way. And this we have to know. And that is sometimes very difficult to hear. But if we can hear it, despite the ongoing temptation, remember, Satan always tries to journey with you. This is why you should get in your car and close the doors quickly. And start bathing yourself in truth quickly. This is why as soon as you get up, you need to start bathing yourself in truth quickly. Ponder truth. Get yourself right into truth. Otherwise, you'll find Satan sitting on your lap and going to work with you. This is why many, many times throughout the day, you reponder truth. Keep yourself lifted all the time. As soon as you stop pondering truth and you stop feeling truth happening as you and truth is leaking from you because you gradually, mostly unwittingly, get drawn back into that which seems to be, then you're sinking again. This is the way it seems to me. We've used the metaphor of a hot air balloon in the past where unless you keep the flame burning then the hot air balloon is going to start descending. And so the flame of truth, we want to keep burning, keep alight. And that is achieved by pondering the straight and narrow truth. It's a beautiful thing. It's easy if we've started our day with truth and felt ourselves lifting, just like that hot air balloon, lifting, 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 until we're free of all concern about that which seems to be. Now, as long as we just keep that flame alight with a little pondering throughout the day, every few minutes, just remember, truth, truth, truth. Every three, four minutes, truth, truth, all is truth. There you go, that's enough. The flame of truth is keeping you high. And then every being you see, this is the being of spirit. It's extraordinary how being appears to be human or physical or mental and local, but being isn't. All of these beings I'm witnessing or even exchanging with, interacting with, are divine being. And every single one of them, no matter whether they just pass the very outskirts of my awareness, is a divine appointment. It's impossible to have the experience of another being unless it were by divine appointment. And what is that appointment for? so that your truth may know their truth. 
I know who you are. You are the very presence of God itself. You are the incorporeal, spiritual being. Therefore, I need take no thought about the way you appear as long as I'm filled with the awareness of the truth that you are. And as we know this truth and as we remain lifted by and as truth throughout our 24 hours, and you will, just a little tangent, you'll get very, very sensitive about your dropping in truth. And you just turn the gas up a little bit, turn the flame of truth up a little bit to make sure you stay in truth. And apart from anything else, by staying in truth and only by staying in truth, are you being truthful to your world? Are you serving your world? Are you feeding? Are you blessing? Are you comforting? Are you supplying? Are you being the love, the light of your world? And so the moment we get out of ourselves and realize what we really are, of course, we want to continually give truth to our world because actually, despite the way our world appears, it is truth. But we are the God of our world or universe and we have to be the God in order to witness God as every being and place, condition, amount, activity, purpose, business. And so if for no other reason, isn't that the best reason? Isn't that the reason that fills us with the most joy and the most fulfillment of being, the most purposeful experience of being? And then as we were speaking of yesterday, we will quickly discover our individual and unique and specific purpose in experience. And as you understand all as being truth, all of experience as being truth, then you'll never think you're slipping out of truth when you find yourself not only experiencing specific aspects of life, but also expressing your talent that is very, very different from any other talent. And so you'll find yourself now filled with that talent, that desire in whatever shape or form that desire is to serve your world, give to your world share with your world in business, in practice, in teaching, in the arts, with whatever work you find yourself with. And this is very important now, to understand the specificity of individual experience, but always knowing it's truth, always knowing that actually there is no specificity in truth, but in experience there most definitely is. And I embrace it. I am most definitely unique in comparison to my neighbor. Most definitely. It's obvious before you even talk to any of us, right? We're all unique. And it's a divine uniqueness in experience. God is individual being in experience. Even in pure spiritual experience, in pure incorporeal experience, God is individual being. And because being is world or universe, then God is individual being, being his and her individual universe. And that never changes. People are very frightened that when they so-called die, and I hope you've listened to that class we had, which explained and gave beautiful authority to the truth that there is no death and there isn't any losing of the body. This is all, again, either material or even metaphysical untruth, misunderstanding or misperception of truth. So I hope you realize that. If you don't or don't have it, let me know. I'll give it to you. But because of this, there is never the loss of individuality. If anything at all is individual now in experience, then it is eternally individual in experience because God doesn't change. We don't have individuality here, and yet after we leave this experience, there is no individuality. That's nonsense. God does not change. 
Everything is individual, always. Our awareness of it always rises. And so our awareness of the individual infinity of being we are always rises, becomes ever more pure, but never with loss of its conscious individuality. When you think of individuality, don't cement it as the individual you believe yourself to be today. That's not your truth. If you're doing that, then you're in the pairs of opposites and you're believing the way you seem to be today. You're believing your life, your history, your future, your ability, your skill. That's nothing to do with you. This is a very lowly awareness of the truth of you. And in its own self, it's true. And again, in its own self, if we withdraw belief from it into truth, then we'll find our very familiar self now truthful and full of truth and full of the resources of truth. But we look the same, we recognize ourselves, and everyone else still recognizes us. But now we know the truth and we're free. We're free in being, body and world. Although we're very familiar to ourselves and to our world. Now the familiarity with ourselves remains eternally. The familiarity with us of others does not necessarily remain eternally. As we had in that class about supposed death, most of, if not all, of those who are familiar with us really think we're dead and really think we've lost our body. That is not true. And they only assume this and believe it, therefore have the experience of it, because they've believed us to be something in and of our own selves. But in truth, We never lose our body. No one loses their body. But in truth, we consciously never lose our body. And we can consciously witness others not losing their body and have the experience and the closeness, the oneness, the love of those that are truly our own just as much as we had before. Everyone else believed they left their body. And in many cases, even more so because their Infinity and omnipresence is consciously known and experienced rather than their temporality and their locality being consciously experienced. Anyway, that's perhaps another class. The important thing to realize is that individual being is always individual being because God is individual being as oneness. And so in God we have oneness individually. I and the Father are one, yet Jesus was indeed an individual and still is this minute and will ever be so. And so as individual being, in truth now, we embrace our glorious talent and start freely and copiously giving of it. And as we do, in truth, we will find that the whole world reacts and responds. All the resources of the infinite always find their way right here so that our copious giving of our talent becomes ever magnified, greater, blessing more and more in our community or our world. You see, we're never not in truth. It's just that we haven't been aware that we are in truth. I live and move and have my being as and in God. I am individual being, and yet the oneness of being, the whole of being. Son, daughter, I am ever with you, and all that I have is yours. Individually, as your being, your body, your mind, your world as your resource, your strength, your wisdom, your knowledge. But there's the condition, make sure you stay in and as and being I. Never fall out of I believing that which appears to be as any kind of reality. It isn't, it's dust, it's a shadow, it's nothing. And as soon as we 
have this glorious and effortless truth of God as being and mind and experience, individually experienced and expressed, then we have our freedom. And it is effortless because there really isn't that much effort involved in staying in oneness, realizing that oneness is all, and then relying on and trusting that that oneness pours through or reveals itself, is a more accurate word, as the resources of the infinite, the world that is love and grace and beauty and joy and purpose, divinity, with no bad in it whatsoever. Everything and everyone and every step and hour, that of divine purpose. That of the very presence and experience of God. It's effortless because the only effort is to hold together or manipulate the pairs of opposites. But there's no effort once we realize oneness and live as one. Realizing oneness as experienced as all, the multitude. But oneness experienced as the multitude of life, the multitude of the world and the universe, is nothing to do with our effort or our making it so. It is already so. And in oneness and just resting and beholding, and then serving that which we behold as being right here for us to serve is the way of truth. It is effortless. Just exactly like the sunrise is effortless. Just exactly like the tides are effortless in our experience. Just exactly like gravity is effortless in our experience. If we can just know this truth, that oneness is the finished kingdom, the infinity and the omnipresence of the finished kingdom of your individual experience, and then rest, keep coming back and resting in oneness, and feeling oneness happen, feeling God happen, and then beholding. And if we're unable to behold truth yet, all the resources here, very real and tangible, yet the health of the body, yet loving relationship, yet peaceful, beautiful home and community, yet the end of the war, the end of greed and injustice, yet then sit and wait because it's there, it's fully embodied and manifested and tangible and demonstrated for you and real and visible right in your consciousness this second. If you can believe that, or even just begin to believe it enough so that the first place you run to is oneness, and realize that it's all finished and fully here for you this second, and then feel it, feel God happening, and realize that that felt happening is the visibility, or is the demonstration, or is the manifestation, or, it, or is the tangibility, the reality of your perfect kingdom, or all your resources, or your healthy, vibrant, vital body, your beautiful, meaningful, intelligent love, your peaceful and beautiful community, your purpose of being and expression. If you can just realize that, and realize that as you're feeling it happening, it will then, as long as you don't go back into the pairs of opposites, spring forth into perfect clarity as your world. If you can just get that and then make it your way, make it your only way to keep coming back and experiencing over and over again and then have the discipline not to go back into the pairs of opposites but to be completely and utterly satisfied, if not exhilarated, if not blissed, all of which will be your experience, with the experience of peace itself happening, then you watch how quickly and easily and naturally all of the world's goods come to you in order that you have the freedom of serving them, sharing them, revealing the truth, 
demonstrating the truth to others who don't know it yet. Letting them watch the miracle of you in action. And one day being inspired to come to you and say, do you know, I've been watching you and you never seem to make a single effort. You never seem to be stressed or strained. You never seem to be in a hurry. And yet, I can't even believe what you're doing or what happens in your presence or what you achieve. I can't believe it. You have something and I'd be so grateful for you to share what you have so that I may have it also. That happens. You know it does. So, my beautiful friends, I do hope that you have caught a good, ripe, plump, ready to feast on glimpse of the truth of the finished kingdom so that you're able to live the finished kingdom now and onwards. And to help you, please know also that 24 hours a day, the light of truth is filling your senses. It's being done for you if you will just know it and then be able to rest and receive. Just rest many, many times throughout the day and gently be attentive to the light filling your senses, the peace filling your senses, filling your whole world. And then know that that light indeed reveals the finished kingdom of you individually and specifically so that you are able to start standing strong in your own experience of truth. Well, let's finish with a few minutes experiencing the kingdom together.
Thank you, thank you. Thank you so very much.